Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the latest episode of the EFL Magazine Business Podcast. Today's guest is Nicola Lutz. Nicola is a sales trainer, mentor and coach, and she likes to help people to sell in an authentic, customer-led way and with activity. She has over 26 years of experience in sales, sales management, sales directorship, training and coaching. She's a director at Study Travel Network and she has her own business in sales training and mentoring called NoFluff.biz. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Hey everyone, buckle up for a new episode of the EFL Magazine Business Podcast. The one and only podcast made to help you launch your business or take your existing business to a level of success you could never have imagined. Whether you're a school owner, freelancer, publisher, or other entrepreneur, you're sure to pick up lots of actionable advice when you listen to the EFL Magazine Business Podcast. Remember to visit EFLMagazine.com for great articles and features. Without further ado, here's your host, the founder of EFL Magazine, Philip Pound. Hello, welcome back, everybody, to the latest episode of the EFL Magazine Business Podcast. And I'm really delighted today to introduce Nicola Lutz to you. Nicola, how are you today? I'm good. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And where are you based? Where are you working from today? I am based in Whitstable, which is in Kent in the UK. Well, let me introduce you properly, I suppose, first. is uh, You have a company called NoFluff.biz. And how would you um, describe your position there? Owner, manager, CEO, founder? What? All of what? that. Yes. All of that. Okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, I'm a director of study travel. Um, so we have a network, magazines, and the Alfie events. So I've been there for a long time, about 26 years I've been with that company. Wow. Okay. So studytravel.network is the um, URL there. And uh, Nicola's company, uh, her sales training company, would that be right in saying sales training? Yeah. Okay. Um, Is nofluff.biz. Okay. So I just wanted to mention the B word. So for everybody, what's he talking about? The B word is Brexit. Of course, it's very topical in the UK at the moment. I hope you have enough petrol for your car. Gasoline for those that don't understand what petrol is. Um, There's a a rush, but um, I just wanted to talk to to you about Brexit, Brexit in relation to the study travel industry. What, what's been happening and are things getting back to normal? Well, things aren't really getting back to more normal because obviously we had Brexit and then we had lockdown as well. So it's been lots of fun. Um, Brexit uh, definitely wasn't something that I voted for. We're all quite annoyed in our sector. It's thrown some challenges up for sure so and some opportunities for some other markets as well so for example for learning english in um, a country where it's natively spoken so malta and ireland are seizing the opportunities there um the uk are finding their way through it's still a very in-demand destination so that's good but obviously we've been hampered by covid as well so it's hard to see the effect yet to be honest um it's definitely affected a few things like work rights or things like the erasmus program things like that but um again there are ways around that and i know that english uk are doing some good work with the government to um lobby for various ways to help the sector um but it it doesn't seem to have affected demand the practicalities might be slightly different um but also the practicalities of literally getting on a plane and Getting anywhere is is a challenge at the moment. Absolutely. And for someone who just got their first job today, uh, it's kind of a weird experience. Uh, There is a slight side effect, but actually I feel a little bit calm. You know, I'm normally quite hyper, but I'm like, ah, okay, well, actually it's not so bad. I don't know. Have you had, you've had your jab? Have you had uh, like any side effects? I was double jabbed. So I'm double jabbed. um, So I'm all good to go. I didn't have, touch wood, I didn't have any side effects, but um, some people have, so um, achy arm and a bit fluey. One of my friends that had her jab, she had had COVID and she 
uh, was laid up for a couple of days after her first jab. So I think it affects people more if they've already had COVID. But um, I've got to say, I absolutely sailed it. It was fine. Good. Ex- excellent. So, yeah, so we talked about uh, study travel and we, we talked about uh, Brexit and the opportunities there. So it's, it's it's something similar to the lobster industry in Scotland, isn't it? They were, uh, trans, you know, they were selling a lot into France and now they have far eastern markets. So, uh, mm. yeah, we can we can work around these things. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I wanted to move on. Oh, uh, before I do move on, uh, tell me a little bit more about study travel. You said you, you mentioned something, a number of events that you have with study travel. Yes. Yeah, so, um, well, study travel was was born really out of a magazine, which when I joined the company, it was monthly. And we didn't even have a website then. That's how old I am. Um, and now we have a monthly magazine. So it specializes in going to agents specifically so it's not a teacher magazine it's specifically for agents we've always specialized in that and then out of that was born um, Alfie which are the um, agents language providers and higher education workshops so they're face-to-face workshops where we bring the agents and the schools um, together and then during Covid obviously face-to-face went went down so uh, we also um, run what we call Alfitos, which are little Alfies online, um, which are good in that they're very focused. So they they focus on, for example, a sending market or a particular provider market. So it might be, for example, um, foundation programs in Germany would be the focus of the Alfito. So that's been an interesting move and it's enabled moving online has enabled a lot of agents to come that wouldn't necessarily have the time or funds possibly to come to an in-person event so they've been they've been great and there are loads of them but we are going back to face to face from January when we have our uh, Malaga Alfie Um, and that's really exciting we're very excited to be going back to face to face and then the magazine magazine continues on because it reaches you know 17 thousand individual agencies around the world Um, and it's their way of keeping in touch a lot of them do go online as well obviously but the print is still very strong despite being an expensive method of getting our news and articles to them but um, and then we have the network which is where anyone in the sector it's like a Facebook and LinkedIn just for the industry Um, and that's where you can make appointments and things for your workshops but also read the news and contribute to the news and promote yourselves and and that kind of thing and that's that's free for anybody to join as long as they're in the industry it's free for anyone okay and for some people maybe as as this is a podcast for entrepreneurs and business owners in ELT so anybody that wants to work uh, opportunities for partnership with uh, study travel um, yeah can you tell Um, me more yes so ways work with us uh, we've obviously got Lots of paid ways, so advertising and attending events, all that usual. Um, free ways if you have news. We have a whole news team dedicated to bringing our agents lots of news from sectors and individual providers. Um, you can sign up to the network, like I said, and promote what you offer up there and link to other people in the industry, which is great, as well as catch up on news. You can actually create your own magazine, so it only shows you the articles of the type that you're looking for that's pretty funky um don't know how that happens but it's very funky either way uh and we're always open to help so i mean we're big supporters of the industry we work with um the agency associations around the globe um and the school associations around the globe as well just to make sure everyone's talking and communicating and helping each other through what are very confusing times So, I mean, it's a company I'm so proud to work with, uh, very ethical, and we we help our readers and our educators so much with communication, and that's been, you know, less isolating for people over the last couple of years. Absolutely. Well needed now more than ever. Um, So just moving on to your own company, nofluff.biz, and uh, how would I... We describe it as a, a sales training company, but of course you're going to say it's a lot more than that. Being a salesperson, 
it's, so we focus on simple sales growth. So actually, we don't want to overwhelm small business owners and entrepreneurs with loads of fluff, frankly, about selling. Um, and in fact, quite often I'll go into a big company and they've put so much stuff around their sales function that they're not doing the basics, which is serving their clients and potential clients. Um, so, I mean, I'm a trained coach as well. So I do coach um, entrepreneurs and business leaders in their selling function. But obviously it's not just selling. It's all about your marketing and the whole customer journey. So lots comes into it. But um and I specialize in doing it in a way that is authentic and has integrity and heart. It's not a wolf of Wall Street, sell me this pen type of thing. Um, you know, lying, cheating and all that kind of stuff isn't really on my agenda. I don't believe you need that. And actually, people can see through it anyway. I think today's buyer is very educated. If you start lying and... Um, manipulating and over promising you're going to be found out pretty quickly so let's not go down that road um so yeah selling with heart and passion and integrity is the type of sales training i give i just want to show you something here nicola this is more as a joke than anything else but do you see one of my questions here <laughs> sell me this pen so um actually i googled it i was doing a little bit of googling before we came on and uh, actually one thing was i i went and i put in nuke nicola no fluff and a podcast came up and i saw oh, nicola's a podcast and i went in and i was reading it it's about sales and then i was uh, oh no the guy's name is called sam de nicola and he's called oh. no, no fluff small business yeah. uh simplified but actually i i started I was scanning it a little bit and it's really good uh, advice there. Uh, so yeah, a shout out to uh, Sam, is it? Yeah, Sam the Nickel. So yeah, so everybody thinks about sales like this. And, you know, I used to work in sales for about 15 years that, you know, they're sleazy, smarmy schmoozers and it's all about closing and pressurizing people. But of course, those people do exist. I mean, uh, you know, we can, we can have, an, <laughs> we can have a, a podcast about those. But um, so how are you different in what you do? How am I different in what I do? Well, a lot of it's down to personality so if, if you like my style then you are more likely to be trained or coached by me so um how am I different so I do lots of free stuff as well so I'm a big believer in giving back I'm in a very lucky position I'm able to do so so this week for example I'm running a free challenge called selling without slime which is interesting what you just said because one of their first tasks is to kind of brain dump all of their prejudices about sales and sleazy slimy shiny suits and all that kind of stuff that comes up a lot um and lots of fear around rejection and, and um not being good enough and what if they say no and all of that kind of stuff so um i help people move over from that mindset and in fact if they need more work on that which some people do if they're running their own business and it's quite isolated as well um, I work with an awesome lady called Ruth Hughes, who um, is a positive psychologist, very clever, very clever lady and very lovely person. And she will work with some of my coaches and my program um, participants on moving your head on from, oh, I'm going to be rejected. I'm going to be pushy. I'm going to be interrupting and all of that. And then I teach the techniques of how to follow up again when you haven't heard from them three, three times, uh, how to do that in a way that you're adding value and you're not bothering them um, and equally those that aren't a fit for you how to move them on and nurture them without having to use your time or their time to to do that so um so that's I don't know if I wandered off the question no there. not at all yeah you're you're very on course um so I remember there's a He's, uh, he probably does the UK circuit quite a lot. When I was uh, doing sales back in the day, and you know, you buy the books and there's all the traditional spin selling and uh, like targeted account selling and all these books. So if you've ever been a salesperson, everybody knows these books. And uh, there was a guy called Steve Outrageous. He does kind of sales seminars. I don't know if you've ever heard of him, but anyway, he does kind of hypnosis as well. So he's kind of getting into that that little territory there but he did say something interesting which i i'd like your opinion on he said that 
nobody likes to be sold to, but everybody likes to buy. Oh, yeah, that's quite a well-known, a well-known saying. If you feel you're being sold to, you're immediately defensive, um, which is why most sales trainers will talk about creating rapport and having empathy and asking good questions and that kind of thing, because um, what people want, just like any human in any situation, is you want to be heard and listened to and valued, just like you would in any situation, not just in a buying selling situation. Um, and that's the sort of thing I train people to do. So you find out if you have a match first and what they need and what they want and what they're struggling and why they wouldn't move if they don't want to change the status quo. And um, yeah, so they don't feel like they're being sold to. So quite often I won't sell to somebody if I don't think I'm the right match for them. I actively will not sell so to them. So, um, and then they feel like they trust me, which is lovely. Um, but I want them to feel good after the experience with me, whether they buy or not. But yeah, nobody wants to be sold to. If you ever Is want that... the experience, you should go to a trade fair or conference if you <laughs> want to be sold to. Is that your experience as well? Depends on the trade fair and whether they've been um, coached by me, because that's generally not the way the people that I work with would sell it's definitely a partnership so all selling is is really an exchange of one piece of value for another piece of value uh, so that everyone benefits that's all that sales is so whether it's money for a service or a product or time for time for example um, it's just an exchange that's all it is and it's and ideally it's it's mutually beneficial so um, just to have someone just talking at you for a solid half an hour at a conference is not, not the way forward. And um, it's still done, sadly, but hopefully not by the people that I have trained. Yeah. If there's a different, it's hope, more of a... I hope not. Yeah, yeah, but I, uh, oh, it does happen, yeah, to be pinned to the wall by somebody and they didn't even actually listen that you're not a decision maker. You know, you, you, we, we all know these situations and they try so much and uh, they don't listen. But, you know, sales is, is, is a much maligned profession, isn't it? I mean, yeah. I think it was, uh, I read a, a survey in newspaper and, and maybe some business journals as well, that it's the most hated profession. Is it? Yeah, it, it, uh, yeah, I think it comes up right on top is that people don't like salespeople. But I think it's more specifically telemarketing, telesales and people yes. you know, being contacted in the evening and maybe, you know, the flood of calls from different different agencies. So do you think that's changing? And also um, for people going into the sales industry that, you know, uh, say, oh, the person's only in sales because uh, they can't get another job or, you know, I'm being devil's advocate here, obviously. <laughs> but uh, do you think that's the case? Is that changing in some way, the perception of sales and salespeople? I don't really think the perception of salespeople has changed. Even the people that I'm talking to on my challenge are still thinking that it's it's embedded in us. And we've uh, most of the people I've been talking to have been through maybe the 80s or 90s where that was still the way to sell. Um, and there's lots of different styles. Like there would be lots of different styles in teaching, for example. So you'll have um, different methods, different methodologies, different curricula and all sorts. So same in selling. And the telesales thing is hardcore. I mean, that is hardcore selling. So quite often what happens is they've got a list of people in their job. It auto dials the next person. They don't have time to, to keep up with the people that they're talking to. They've got to follow a, strip, a script. They're told to follow a script. Um, and that's not my favourite type of selling, though it can be very uh, a very good basis for someone starting out, but it's probably going to sap the soul out of you to be honest um, but it's a really good way of getting through a lot of people quickly so if you need volume of general public to go through your sales funnel then that's probably one of the ways to do it and there are lots of outsourcing companies that you can get to just call through a massive list of people for you um, most of the work I do is with people well a selling a service of some description rather than, you know, a phone or a broadband or double glazing or whatever it is. It's mainly service-based um, and quite often high value. So, so quite, you know, 
For example, traveling to learn a language is quite a high investment for a lot of people. There's some counseling involved to find out even just levels, but all sorts of things. Um, and that is, uh, funnily enough, that is still selling, but the people doing the counseling don't really think of it as selling. So, and actually that's the best way to be. Stop thinking about it as selling and think about it as helping those people but um is it outdated i think the whole telesales in the evening thing will stay because there are companies that need that volume um but in most other companies so the entrepreneurs and the small businesses that i work with or anything that's person to person uh will need to have a better approach a much more human approach because like i said today's buyer is a lot more savvy and they want to be heard and they want to know the people behind the company and the ethos behind the company and why these people um, do what they do and, and whether they buy into that. So a lot of it, like I said before, is quite personality based. So the personality of your school or your brand uh, will come into it, particularly if you're selling to Generation Z and the younger millennials. They want to know why you do what you do, what your ethics are, how you contribute, there's a lot more in it and they'll find that out probably even before they've spoken to you, before they become a lead. And um, I don't think we should underestimate them. Yeah. So that kind of takes me back for the high volume telemarketing, telesales, FAB selling. We'll talk about that in, in a second. You know, the salt mines of the uh, telemarketing mm -hmm. industry and, you know, you have to make what 100 decision maker contacts per day so for anybody who doesn't know what's involved you you make it you have a, a script or, or sometimes you have a, a template that you work from you ask open questions so you say oh hello nicola do you have a uh, telephone what kind of telephone system do because i use work for telephone company so t telephone mm -hmm. how many calls do you make a day and then you, you have this conversation and suddenly then you start matching what your product what your product offering service offering is and then the the closed questions is and I tried to funnel them in and then there's the close the assumptive close which is uh and would you like to go ahead with that and we can put that on your bill or something like that so that's one kind of selling that people i'm sure everybody has if they haven't done it they've been on the receiving end so mm. but tell me about other kinds of selling so let's talk talk about consultative selling which is more what you do you know and uh, your agents and your your coaches do so tell me about that yeah well, consultative selling is, as it says on the tin, really. So you're consulting with that potential buyer um, first. So, uh, and that can be done, doesn't have to be done over the phone, for example, or face to face. Some of that can be done through your website or a form or a lead magnet, like a quiz or something like that. So you can um, part qualify the leads that come into your sales funnel earlier. So, for example, if you only say you only teach business people, uh, you need to actually move out of your funnel those people that want that are junior learners, for example. So you need to pre-qualify, um, and then when you get the good leads, and then you consult with them um, by whatever method that is, direct messaging or email or calls or, or zooms or whatever it is, and it's all about the questions and again finding out if there's a fit. Um, there's the good acronym BANT, which means that you have to, you can't close a sale without knowing if the BANT is ticked, which is budget, authority, need, and timeline. Um, so you need all of those things in place uh, and you need to find them out without sounding sleazy. So asking someone if they've got the budget to buy what you have can feel super awkward, especially to British people. <laughs> so talking about money, terrifying. Um, but there are other other ways of doing that so you could introduce price before they even get to you so you could give them a ballpark figure so, or um, they could go through like a preliminary quote kind of figure um, so they have an idea of the sort of budget that they will need but at some point we need to talk about the cash side of things and uh, get over that um, but most importantly on the consultative sales side is the questions that you ask um, and listening, actively listening to the answers in order to understand rather than to sell. So you're listening to understand. You're going on a journey together to see if this fit. You're not just waiting for an opportunity for your pitch. That's the basics of consultative selling. OK, and that's uh, it's very important what you said about qualifying. So that's 
from both ends, isn't it? That, you know, you qualify your prospect, but, uh, you know, it could be the wrong fit for them, but also could be the wrong fit for you, that you may gain the customer, but it could end up being a big problem for your company. Yes, and I know that in uh, when times are tough or you're just starting out that you kind of take everything that, that you can get. Um, so I get that, and we, we would probably all do it. Um, but as time goes on, start being a bit more picky about your ideal client persona and who you want to work with, who you know you can help. Um, sometimes there are companies that call me in or the head will call me in and actually they're, the way they're set up, I can't help them because even if I revolutionise the sales team, it's not coming from above. So it's not going to link in with anything. It's not going to be bought in by other departments. And that's actually the sort of company I will turn down working with because I don't want to charge them. I mean, again, it's ethical. I don't want to charge them lots of money to consult with them and nothing can change. So that's not the way I would sell. Lots of people would, but mm-hmm. that's not do so what one thing that just getting back and we'll talk a little bit about money in a second but um i think people feel a little bit icky with salespeople when they you know overly nice and uh, you know we have something at the back of our mind what, what's what's this guy you know what's his angle and uh, so it's like oh hello how are you dude blah, blah, blah. but um for example there's this book i don't know if you're aware of it it's uh, i would recommend it for anybody it's called anybody in uh, in business. It's called what does it what start, it with start with no. Yeah. So basically, his thesis is that there is this problem in sales, and it's not just in sales, but in negotiation, giving uh, you know uncomfortable news to whether that be your boss or um, to your your partners, counterparts, is that you actually come out straight away and say what you want. And then that kind of diffuses the hesitancy in the person's mind. So you're like, oh, okay. So he he gives some examples in the book, and he says, you know, that uh, you lost a you lost an order, or you, you you know, some something fell through. So you immediately address it, and then that's you know from from the other end. But if it's like, well, you're you know, you're you're tiptoeing around the issue. That's. Um, that's when things can go wrong. What do you think about this idea? I would recommend this book, by the way. Yeah, I've noted it down. I love a good book. Um, I believe in being authentic and truthful. Mm. Um, so, for example, as I've mentioned, this, this five-day challenge I do is free for people to join up. Um, but right at the beginning, I do say I'm going to be offering you a place on my program. You don't have to buy it. You can get all this stuff for free, but very much from the start to say the payback for me giving you five days worth of free sales coaching is I'm going to put the offer to you. Feel free to say no. But if it's a fit for you, feel free to say yes. And if you're not sure, let's have a call and a chat about it. So that does diffuse it. So I think that's a good a good sales tactic. Um, You do. I mean, people are scared of doing that because. you know, people just might say, no, thank you straight away and put the phone down. <clears throat> but um, so I understand that. But it might be that you could go in with um, this is what I offer. Can I just take a few minutes of your time to see if there's a potential way we can work together? So they know that. And I, and I think that's an easy way to to overcome that fear. But, yeah, no, I believe in being upfront about it. And you were also upfront about what you charge because uh, going to your website, your you know the the yeah. rates are there, aren't they? People can see them front and center. Yeah, it's quite rare actually that you can do that. And again, I still, even though I totally believe in it, I still had that little frisson of fear going. Oh, publishing my prices—that's terrifying. Um, but I think if people know they want to work with me, they need to know how much it is. And if it's beyond the budget of some people, there's plenty of free stuff they can get as well. Um, and maybe it's something they need to, to work towards. Or if they're not sure, they can chat with me. But yeah, I'm very upfront um, about my pricing. Uh, most trainers and coaches aren't unless it's a set program. They probably will be then. But otherwise, yeah, no, I like being transparent. And it's qualification as well. You don't have to worry about having these, you know, it's it saves time. You know, you don't have to have this conversation. And you yeah, know, yeah. 
contact me and say, actually, I can't afford your one-to-one package. Um, but it sounds really interesting. What would you advise? And then we, we talk about it from there. And some of them go on to work with me and some of them don't. I mean, with my group coaching program, there's money back guarantees and things. And there's no quibble about it. If you feel if you join one of my group programs and you don't make your money back, within six months or so, just ask me and I will give you your money back. It's not, and I will work with you until you do make your original investment back because I'm very confident in what value I bring to companies. And that's, you know, that's taken me several years to get to and so years of testing and working with people. Um, and I think know your worth is important. So, uh, but that's a real mindset block for lots of people. They're not... confident in their worth to other people yet, especially at the beginning of their journeys. Mm, And that's something I read in um, Mr. Uh, Sam the Nicholas blog there that, you you know, about about your worth. But um, yeah, so people, uh, before I go on to that subject, I want to talk about rejection. So, Mm. uh, for example, you said that a lot of people who start out in sales and still do, there's a, what's it called? Call reluctance. Isn't that what they call it? It's like people don't want to pick up the phone. And I think I sell all sales people have had this. You come back after Christmas or something and you're like, you're not feeling so well. And no, and you know, the people that you're going to be calling are not in the mood to listen to either. So the, you know, certain times it's, it's natural, but you know, as I said, I worked in, in telesales at the beginning and I, I thought I literally talked to, thousands of people probably tens of thousands but actually nobody is really nasty no nobody but- I mean, well one or two i mean out of 10 20 000, you you'll get them and actually the problem is and not just not just as as a salesperson but as uh, somebody who receives sales calls is people don't actually like saying i'm not interested they would rather say anything else. You know, for example, my mother get telemarketing calls and she say, call back tomorrow or something. And the guy calls back because it's on a dialer. You know, it's all through the system. I said, oh, my God, that's them ringing again. And I, I just pick up and say, sorry, we're not interested. No more. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm talking about? We all know this from, from sales. <laughs> I do. And, I, and maybe we need to equip people with a way of of saying no as well because actually that saves you time if someone is definitely not interested in what you offer it saves you a lot of time you don't want those people kicking around in your sales pipeline calling them back and calling them back again and I know people are being very polite but actually maybe you need to give them the opportunity to say this isn't a fit as well I think do that to say well is this what you're looking for um and they say well, call me back tomorrow so well if you, you know I'll call you back tomorrow and we can talk but if you're not interested just let me know now and I don't have to bother you and give them the opportunity yeah okay very good advice there so I wanted to go on to your worth and what things cost in the industry I remember when I worked in the recruitment industry first starting off and uh they're saying you know to place a person for example we, we worked in um what was it office placements and uh, also we did some temp stuff as well and you know to place an employee is about 15 percent of the first year's salary maybe and at that time it was maybe twenty five thousand euros or something so you know be uh in around that so um you'd be talking about three grand maybe placement and and of course that goes up then when you when we look at this industry uh, in headhunting, and of course, a lot of headhunters don't say they're recruiters, but you know, uh, there is a bit of crossover there as well, but they like to see themselves as a distinct industry. So for a headhunter, for example, a retainer to place a CEO or CFO is like 30, 40,000 euros, mm-hmm. pounds, dollars. So you pay that money straight up front, and then there is a percentage of salary. So if the CEO is getting whatever, 200, by 500 million, uh, the company does that for placement. So just to give you an idea that these high value sales are out there and they're expected in the industry. So um, for you selling a you know, high value, high ticket item, is that, I, I don't like using that because that sounds like Dan Locke or something, which I, I don't like these uh, fake gurus, but um, yeah. So how do you get people comfortable with selling something that they think is really expensive? How do I get the person selling to feel comfortable? Um, I think you've got to know the value of it to the person that you're selling to. I think we quite often in companies, we start with what we're selling and what we think it's worth. 
which is the wrong way around. You've got to think about who you're selling it to and what value is it to them. Um, and that's why people use recruiters, especially good re recruiters, um, because they will charge for all that legwork that you don't have to do, <laughs> hunting around for the right candidates and filtering them and testing them and have them put in. It's a lot of time. And if you're um, the head of a company and you don't, what you don't have is time. Time is the most precious commodity. Um, and also you don't have the network necessarily and you don't want to upset your competitors by going and stealing their staff but a recruiter can so it takes away all of that so the value to them to just have it done is is huge and you think about all sorts of things that we buy where it just takes the faff out of it so anywhere that's easy to purchase so even someone was talking the other day about asos asos the clothing company it's really easy to buy from them it's really easy to return stuff. It's really easy to look at things that you like and create lists. It makes it a friction-free process and people pay for that. And that's why people pay for a good hotel rather than a functional hotel. You pay for ease and luxury and quality. And so you need to know where you are. And it might be that you're a, a budget service and that's fine because you're then targeting people that want to save money. But if you're selling a high ticket item, you're targeting people that want less faff, less pressure, less stress. And they're going to be saving time and money as well. So you just need to know what it's worth to the customer that you're serving. Um, and recruiting, particularly if you hire the wrong person, that's a really expensive mistake. By the time you've gone through onboarding, Several months of onboarding, you've lost traction, especially in sales. You've got, you know, it takes an average of six months to onboard a salesperson. Um, and by that time, you've lost clients. So it's a really expensive thing. So to avoid that mistake, that's why you use the higher ticket items. Okay. And so when we get to the sales process and we're, we're near closing and uh, you know, if you go to any CRM system, it, it kind of does it for you. You know, you, you got your prospect, you got 10%, uh, which I, I was never really good at this. It was like, Oh, maybe it's 80%, but it was like uh, actually 10%, you know, you know, this problem, this is a little bit like uh, the Brexit uh, trade deals. I, when I first heard Brexit, it was like, Oh, we're going to get uh, a trade deal with the U S Australia. I said, this is like when I was a salesperson, I used to say everything I was going to close, but uh, <laughs> it's not that easy, is it? Um, no. So we're, we're at that part. Okay. We've closed it. Yay. So it, it's done it. The, the client has, uh, has made po positive noises and they want to work with you. And they want to talk about details. One problem that, salespeople have and if they've just come from a sales background and for those who haven't come from from a sales background this is, this is something that you know you might take on which would be unhelpful is to keep selling after the sale is made mm -hmm. yeah absolutely it's all part of the service so the cheapest customer is is a customer you already have that you've already gone through all that process with so retention is is a big part of your sales strategy um, and over delivering if at all possible is going to delight you should be looking at delighting your customers throughout um, and not just delighting them but there are opportunities there to cross sell or upsell or renew obviously if it's contract based so there are all those opportunities but don't just communicate with your clients in order to sell them something else um, that's not likely in fact insurance companies do that i had a rant recently about auto renew on car insurance and how um, the quotes are always higher than they give to new people which irritates me um, and you have to phone them and wait on the phone for two hours before you can cancel the auto renew that's no way to treat existing clients and i will never give them my business again because of that um, i will go to a company that allows me to cancel the auto renew and then choose whether they had given me good service. Um, but another company I buy from a supplier, they send me um, helpful tips and things. So uh, and, and a great company, actually, a plant company I've, worked, I've bought from, not worked with. They um, send you the plant that you've bought and they give you little videos and, and make it fun. And then they'll send you little reminders to water and feed your plant. 
as you go and then it will ask you to review your plant and send photos of your plant baby as they call them so they really engage you in the process then and they only occasionally try and sell me another plant most of it is value uh, value add and engagement which I find really fun. Um, and then if they want, if I, they might send me an offer for another plant and I'm very likely to buy it from them rather than anybody else because they've delivered. And I see in your background, you have some nice succulents there. Is that right? And you have your spider plant, is it? And the, uh, yeah. This is a cheese plant over here. Ah, the one behind, just behind your head is spider, is it? That's a spider plant ah. in there. So, yeah, so my slogan is simple sales growth. So a lot of my imagery is all about growth and uh, I get a little bit hippie about what we can learn from plants in terms of business and all sorts of things. But I love a plant. Yeah, they change, they change the whole atmosphere of a room, don't they? You just have a little, little plant on your desk. So um, managing expectations. Now, this is something that is very important in sales, isn't it? We, we touched on it a little bit. I remember when I worked for... Uh, I would say a recruitment online recruitment company and I had one client and uh, we did a trial when we did trials and we we didn't do trials anymore we became too successful for trials so and uh, I think we were looking to recruit maybe 20 people I can't even remember what the job was but uh, he got a lot of applications but didn't hire anybody and then I had another company I think she uh, she uh, she had a lot of applications she hired 10 people and the first guy was really happy. He said, you know, oh, I didn't hire anybody, but I'm definitely going to sign up for a year. And the second person, she said, uh, I'm not happy with the service, even though she hired 10 people. Mm -hmm. So this kind of is managing expectations to know first what the client wants, isn't it? It is. You need to have done your discovery well enough. And I didn't. So that was, that was my lesson there. Yeah. <laughs> That's the lesson learned. I think um, always aim to over deliver. Um, as I've said, managing expectations is all down to your salespeople as well. And the salespeople don't really want to make anything sound bad, but they're going to have to frame if they want repeat business, particularly, then you need to train them to manage those expectations because otherwise you'll lose that customer long term, which is an expensive thing because then you've got to go all the way through the whole process of finding, finding a new customer. So, yeah, get your sales teams to know, know how to manage those expectations. Yes, sure. Another good question, actually, a sales manager once uh, gave me this piece of advice, and actually it's, it's proved very useful. And uh, I worked for quite well-known company. Well, it was a very well-known company, but this might not be an issue or maybe useful still for some of our listeners is that you ask the client, what do you know about our company? What do you know about our service? What do you know about this kind of service? So, yeah. so basically, my point was that, for example, I work for a newspaper, and a lot of people have the wrong idea about who our who our readership were, ABC, and you know what kind of features, what kind of supplements we had, and you know how much how much things cost. But would you think of that as a useful question to ask uh, potential clients or even existing clients? I think it's helpful further down the line. It's not something I would open with because the opening of the relationship should all be about the buyer. So, you know, what I'll tell you what I know about your company, um, but you tell me where I'm wrong and what, what you're struggling with or what I can help with, and then I'll see what we can do to help you. That's more how I would come at it. Um, but I do think... Um, Existing buyers, existing clients will buy the thing that they buy from you. And if you have anything else, they might not really think about it because in their head, they're finished. They're, they're done. They're in. It's all fine. So educating them as to what else you do um, should be part of your retention plan as well. So um, it could be that when you're sending the extra value items after they've bought that part of that could be an introduction to what else you have, for example. So it could be, um, let's say, someone's bought a holiday. You've bought the holiday, you're in. That's fine, and you've gone through all the options. But it might be, later on, I've sent you 10 top tips to beer in Spain, if that's where you're going. And then the next one is, you know, what to do about your visas and stuff, or travel docs. 
And then the next one might be um, just to check. We do we do offer insurance as well. You didn't buy it, and that's fine. But we want to make sure you're covered. And then I'll probably give a couple of case studies. So then that's the way I would cross sell different products. So uh, from a place of service and help. So is it, it's very much like the accessory selling, isn't it? So you buy an expensive suit and say, why don't you buy these pair of socks for 50, 50 euros, 50 pounds? But actually, yeah. in, in, re, in normal circumstances, you'd never buy a pair of socks for 50 pounds, would you? But because you paid a thousand for the suit, the, the socks seem a bit cheaper. That kind of yeah. idea? Yeah. It's, yeah. Mm. Usually with, with cross-selling, so cross-selling is where you add on another product to the product that has been bought uh, or service that has been bought. And usually it's about 50% or lower of the original purchase price. That's that's the tech behind a cross-sell. Um, so socks and a suit would fit fine. Insurance and a, um, you know, insurance and a holiday would fit fine. There are some classics in the... Um, you know, McDonald's will always say, do you want fries with that? So again, it's a classic cross-sell. Um, if you ever buy a coffee in one of the coffee chains at breakfast time, they'll offer you a croissant as well, usually. So there, it happens all the time. Um, and then to work effectively, they need to be related to the original purchase. There's no point saying, you know, you go to buy your coffee and they say, oh, and by the way, would you like, um, I don't know, a Halloween-shaped biscuit? necessarily it's, it's not quite related but if you said oh you know would you like one of our reusable cups and it's related so you know you're more likely to say yes okay. while you're in a per mind so an another factor is uh, I, I think this has been called a uh, i can't remember that it was the uh Weekend MBA or Pocket MBA. I, I read this book a, a long time ago. I'm sorry for the uh, authors. I can't remember his name, but I'll put it in the show notes. And he he talked about hassle factor. So people don't like hassle, do they? And yeah. I think one, one story I heard very similar to maybe accessorizing or hassle is that they did an experiment in in LA and it was they were selling a house one realtor real estate agent was maybe 20 minute taxi ride from another. And they said in, in one agent, the house was, let's say, $500,000. And then they said, oh, by the way, because of X, you can save $200 if you just take, we'll pay for the taxi ride. You can go to our other office. And people are like, no, I don't want to save $200. I'm paying $500,000. So, yeah, it's an interesting one. But, yeah, so talk about hassle factor. How can we, as salespeople or as business people, Oh, you know, there's time and there's money, of course. Uh, how can we take hassle away from people's lives in our selling and no. customer service? Um, without walking through each buyer journey of each of your listeners, it's difficult to know, but I, it's something that you can do yourself. So walk the walk. So take the exact steps that someone would go through to buy from you. And before you go move on or click or whatever it is, think how you can make that step easier. So, uh, you know, multiple clicks. Most people know that multiple clicks on a website is hassle. So you need to avoid that. How can you make it easier for them? Um, an interesting example, I think, is Starbucks, who um, watched the film, the footage of um, people buying their morning coffee. So quite often, not probably now, but they had they would just build another Starbucks on the other side of the road because people couldn't be bothered to cross the road to go and get their Starbucks. So just very tiny bits of hassle. But as soon as you make it easy for them, which cross-selling does, so, you know, buy your socks now, they're $50 or whatever, but they'll stop you worrying about whether you've got the right socks to match this fantastic suit you've just bought. You're not letting yourself down and you don't have to go and look around for, for socks or forget. And then you're, you know, so you're just taking ease out of it. That's all. Okay, and for people in this industry, so let's say the people are working maybe in English teaching, language teaching, or, um, you know, want to make a transition and they, they want to get into sales, you know, they're, they're newbies. What, what kind of advice? Where would they start? Of course, you can buy, uh, you can contact Nicola directly. Nicola, what's your uh, email address? Just uh, while I uh, will insert it here. 
nofluff.biz. Nicola, nofluff.biz, and you can go to Nicola's site, www.nofluff.biz. So for somebody starting out in sales, and you said, you know, you offer a lot of things for free. Uh, where, where do people start? I um, always start with the customer, actually. So know who your customer is and what they're feeling, good, bad, and ugly, and work out how you help them with that so, and what they aspire to feel and whether they aspire to save money or time or avoid losing money or time. Um, so I would go with an ideal client persona or avatar, work out their hopes and dreams and desires and fears and objections and what they watch on telly and what they find funny and what sort of age group they are and where they are. I always start with the customer knowing them inside and out um, and then look at how you can serve them with, with what you have or a tweak of, of what you have um, and start from there. So I believe you mentioned fab selling actually, which I've covered before. So I talk a lot about benefits led selling where you talk about um, either saving time or money or an emotional benefit which you then justify with all the nice facts about what it is you offer so for example um i could sell my program to people that feel icky about sales hate selling think it's sleazy and horrible i can get you from that to feeling a bit more in control and confident and knowing what you're doing and able to fit it in your day and some people will sign up on the back of that without me telling them actually what the program is all about they just want to feel confident in control and not icky about selling because they they need more sales in their business um so you're selling that benefit rather than you know it's a six-week program with an hour here and an hour there and downloads of this you know so um benefits led selling will really help there and one one tip for me is that for, for somebody who's uh, like kind of done the more consultancy sales and selling advertising, which is uh, you know, one of the more difficult, especially um, in newspapers, it's one of the more difficult types of sales that you can make, is that um, you don't have to know everything. So here's yeah. the tip. So I remember I used to work for an IT magazine. Now my IT knowledge is basically this: turning on the you know Word and all the <laughs> all the basic CRM systems. Sometimes all front end, of course, even website front end. But um, yeah, so I, I dealt with a lot of people who knew a lot about IT. So and we did features on things I I didn't I'd never heard before. But you don't need to know everything. You just have to like put some of the problems that you can see in the market do a little bit of research put it to them they like to talk and it's not about uh, it's the emotional thing it's the the hassle that you're taking away it's yeah. listening isn't it it's listening we don't want to bore them rigid with all the tech stuff because quite often people that are buying it from you don't want to know how it's done they just want it done i mean it's um i liken it to um Popeye the sailor's man if you remember those so of course walking along, yeah. a bloke and then uh some drama happens he reaches into his jacket and for some random reason has a can of cream spinach in there which he then eats and becomes all muscly and confident wins the day wins the girl um and is the local hero now people want to get to that Popeye post spinach they want to get to the, you know, the bulging muscles, not necessarily, but they want that feeling of being confident and in charge and winning the day and happy and all that kind of stuff. They don't really care how they get there. So that's the bit you need to sell to them. You sell the transformation, not the method of transformation. So in English language teaching or any language teaching, um, what these people want to do isn't necessarily just learn English, for example, what they want to do is um, be able to go to university and follow the lectures or make their parents proud or be able to do business in, in that language because it's for their business so they can feel it, like they've achieved. Not actually about reaching a certain IELTS score, for example. So you sell the transformation and then you tell them how you're going to get them there. But they won't care too much about how you're going to get them there. They just want to know that you're going to get them there. Excellent. And I think that's a, that's a great way to finish today, Nicola. Um, 
So Nicholas' site is nofluff.biz, www.nofluff.biz. And Nicola, N-I-C-O-L-A, at uh, nofluff.biz. And uh, thank you again, Nicola. It was really a pleasure to have you on the show. It was lovely to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Thanks for listening to the EFL Magazine Business Podcast with Philip Pound. For more great advice and resources, check out eflmagazine.com. If you found this podcast helpful, be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. See you next time.